Good morning and welcome to Jersey Shore Baptist Church. If you stand with us this morning as we turn to 464 on our hymnals, 464, who is on the Lord's side?
All right, let's open up our service in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you for today, God. We just thank you for all that you do. We thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy to us, God. We're just thankful for another morning to be in your house. Uh, Lord, we're just thankful for another morning that we can praise and worship your name. Uh, Lord, we're just thankful for another morning that we can just come in and serve you. And uh, Lord, we're just thankful for this church. We're thankful for being able to meet here. Uh, God, we pray you just have your hand on this service. I pray that your spirit would flow through here. Uh, God, I pray you just be with the praise and worship, God. I pray that you would just bless it. I pray that it would be a sweet-smelling savor to you. Uh, God, I be, pray you be with the specials, Lord. I pray that you would be with uh, the preaching. I pray just fill pastor with your Holy Ghost power. Uh, God, I pray we just hear from you uh, in this church this morning. Uh, God, we're just thankful for all the fathers that are here. God, we're just thankful for uh, them. Lord, we just pray you just bless the rest of this service. Uh, Lord, we're just very thankful for how good you are. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may remain seated as we turn to number 39. Number 39, take my life and let it be. Praise the Lord. Well, we're glad that you're here. Uh, by the way, uh, Cindy and I would like to thank all of you that prayed for us. We made it back safely from our uh, little trip to Alaska on Friday. Uh, we had an awesome time. If you want to see any pictures, see her because I don't really have any. But uh, she, can, she can fill in all the details and show you some of the stuff that we did. But we had a great time with uh, my daughter and her husband and family. And uh, also, we got to see a lot of things while we were there. And that was, that was a blessing. Um, I wanted to thank all of you that are here that are fathers. Where would we be without the dads? And, uh, you know, we have a, um, a dearth in America of, of dads that are being the fathers that they ought to be. And, uh, but I believe the men that are in this room that are dads are taking their responsibility very seriously. And we want to honor you and we want to thank you for all that you've done uh, in helping to rear your children and uh, we're just so thankful for you. And over there on the uh, baptistry, if you're wondering what that box is over there in the corner, that's the baptistry, by the way. It's a little portable baptistry. Everybody says, what is that thing over there in the corner? Um, but anyway, there's, a, uh, there's some bottles of pop. Get it? Pop. And uh, some nuts, because your dads are pretty nutty. So anyway, there's some nuts over there and a bottle of pop. Meat. Please make sure that you take some. We had a, a couple of fathers here for the last service, and I don't think they took there. So uh, we're going to have Mr. Eson standing there at the doorway, uh, making sure that it, you dads get your, your, uh, your free gift, because uh, if they're left over, the kids are going to get them. And, and I'll tell you what, if you leave a lot left over, we're going to give all your small children three or four bottles of that soda and then send them home <laughs> to you. So make sure you get them. <clears throat> um, I wanted to make mention tonight, uh, traditionally what we do, the kids went to camp this week, they had a great week at camp, and uh, boy, I'll just, 
I just thought about this just now. We've been going to camp now for, I guess, 19 or 20 years since I've been the pastor here. And um, we haven't had a, a glitch as far as camp's concerned. And uh, we just praise the Lord, you know, for his safety and uh, his provision. And, you know, just uh, listen, we, we don't, you know, fundamental independent Baptists are not known for their brand new vehicles that they drive around. Uh, our, our van is not too old. Uh, I think it's, what, a 2013 or 2000. 14, uh, as close to new as we'd ever were going to get. And, uh, but, uh, you know, old vehicles and, you know, you just, you know that anything could happen. I mean, a little bolt could come loose on a highway when you're doing 65 miles an hour down the road. And, and uh, we, we know by him, by God, all things consist. And God has just been so good to us through the years. And I praise the Lord for the safety going there, coming back. Um, just the camaraderie of the kids. They had great spirit. Nobody got hurt at camp from our group anyway. I don't know if that's true camp-wide, but uh, our kids all came back safe, and we're just so thankful for that. Anyway, on Sunday evening, typically the Sunday when they come back from camp, if we can do it, we have the uh, teenagers give testimonies. So if your team was at camp and you can make it back to church tonight, I know it's Father's Day, and typically Father's Day, like Mother's Day, uh, you know, there's a lot going on. You may have family things going on. But if you can be back tonight, we want to have our teenagers uh, give a testimony and uh, share a little bit about what went on uh, in their camp experience. I understand that they, had a, they were giving some testimonies in the van, I heard, and, and the testimonies are real good. And I'm looking forward to hearing some of them uh, tonight. Also, tonight, uh, Paul's not going to be, be able to be here tonight. Uh, he typically preaches on Sunday night. Uh, he's going through the Christology right now. And uh, we've been really enjoying that. So tonight I'm going to fill in for him since I haven't preached for a while. I need to get back into, into preaching. I've been gone for two weeks. And uh, I'm going to preach tonight. And uh, honestly, I got this idea from the church we visited in Fairbanks, uh, actually North Pole, Alaska is the town we were in. And uh, the pastor did a Sunday school lesson on Pride Month. And I never, you know, I don't really get into the topics of the day, but we have a lot of stuff going on in our culture today with pride, you know, gay pride, pride. You know, there's typically, there's two extremes Christians take. They either go way off to the right and, you know, you got the gay bashing and really they take a, a harsh stand, I would say beyond the biblical stand. But the other extreme is just as dangerous. We don't talk about it at all. We don't stand for what God says about homosexuality and all those things. And so tonight we're going to look at really this whole gay pride issue, Pride Month, through the, the lens of pride think about it. Pride uh, is really the, the root of that. And so uh, we're going to talk about that tonight. And uh, so I want to encourage you to come back if you're able to come back. If not, you can watch it on the live stream. Uh, you know, catch it, uh, the, the rerun on the live stream on Facebook there. So, all right. Um, if you're visiting with us, we're glad that you're here. I didn't see anybody that, we, oh, we have a Stephanie's family is here. With us. Praise the Lord. We're glad that you got visiting for the very first time. I lost my mic here. Anybody first-time visitors? We're glad that you're here, whether you're visiting or not visiting. Um, if you, and this goes for anybody, whether you've been uh, a first-time visitor or if you've been, you know, visiting our church for a while, or if you're visiting online, we have a button on our website uh, that says "My Response." And if you want to get any information from us, as far as sometimes we'll send out emails. Well, not sometimes. Usually once a week, we'll send out emails with the Zoom links and all that kind of thing. We'll let you know about special stuff going on. We don't bombard your email inbox, but we do send out emails periodically to let you know what's going on. Or if you have any questions about the church, any information you want to know, or you just want to get to know us better, and we can get to know you better, just hit that button and give us whatever information you'd like to give us or you're comfortable with giving us, and uh, we'll be able to communicate with you. And thank you properly for coming and uh, being with us today. And so uh, I, I mentioned this morning, we're, we're taking a little bit of a different approach uh, some of my fundamental independent Baptist brethren would call me a heretic for this, but uh, uh, regarding visitors, um, typically what we used to do is is somebody gave us a visitor's card or somebody came to the church and we would make sure they got a visitor's card and we would really push them hard to fill that visitor's card out and then we would go visit them whether they wanted a visit or not. And we're not going to do that anymore. If you want us to visit you, we're going to visit you. If you need any help at all, we're here for you but we're not going to harass you. We know in the culture we're living in today, people are really, they're a little bit apprehensive about 
Uh, now, we're still going to go door knocking and all that kind of stuff, you know, just in a general way, trying to get information in people's hands regarding the gospel. But uh, we're going to leave it up to you to decide whether you want us to come by, call you, bother you, whatever. And we will if you want us to, but we won't if you don't. And so how you'll let us know about that is you'll fill out that thing that my response and say, I would like a visit from the pastor or whatever, and then we'll, uh, we'll get in touch with you. All right? All right. We're going to sing another song. Seek ye first. If you stand with us this morning, it's not in the hymn book, but it'll be on the screen. Seek ye first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Everybody. We're going to be in 2 John this morning. 2 John, we're out of 1 John. We're in 2 John, and we're going to be reading from verse 4 to verse 6. Verse number 4 to verse 6. I'll read 4 and 5, and then all together we will read verse 6. I'll begin in verse 4. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a, um, as we have received a commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady... Not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. Verse 6 altogether. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. May the Lord bless the reading of his word as we sing another song. Amen. Remain stain, standing uh, for... Hymn number 10, hymn number 10, I have decided to follow Jesus. 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 No turning back. announcements here. Uh, we've been announcing Faith Bible Institute. It's a course designed for any Christian looking to deepen their knowledge of the Bible. If you're interested in learning more about this program, you can click on the Faith Bible Institute button on our website, or you can ask Wade for any more information on that. There's two links on there, one that'll take you right onto the website, and another link with instructions for 
how to register. And an important thing, there is a deadline of July 1st. If you're looking to um, be a part of this program, um, you need to register before July 1st. And we're praying, or Lord willing, we can get this started in the fall. Soul Winning Blitz, we had our first one of the summer yesterday. And uh, we handed nearly 330 uh, John and Romans with gospel tracts and invitations to church. And our next one will be July 17th. That's a Saturday at 1030 in the morning. We have another one coming up August 7th. Northeast Vision Summit, July 27th through the 29th. And that's a, sum that's a conference at Solid Rock Baptist Church in Berlin, New Jersey. And if you wanted to attend the day sessions that they have there on uh, Wednesday and Thursday, you can register on their website, summit.northeastvision.org. And they do have evening services July 27th through the 29th. Vacation Bible School is around the corner August 8th through the 11th. And that's for kinder kids in kindergarten through 6th grade. And there will be a teen class available as well. If you're interested in helping with this event or have any questions, you can see Mrs. Ashley Acosta. And again, that's August 8th through the 11th. And then junior camp is coming up. Pray for um, that. And that's uh, join the third and sixth graders for all over the, from all over the Northeast as they spend a week at Camp Calvary. Camp is filled with fun activities such as swimming, paintball, outdoor, acti outdoor adventures, cabin competitions, and great preaching for children. And that's August 23rd through the 27th. So be in prayer for the kids that are going to be attending junior camp. And then one last announcement. Um, Brother Bob Bertold asked me, if you're part of the safety team, there's going to be a meeting following the morning service, so please make sure that you stay following the service. Anyone that's in the safety team will be meeting right after the service here. And those are all of our announcements. If you brought your offering this morning, we have the offering box at the back of the church there by the wall in the window. And if you'd like to give, um, that, there's that. And then also if you're watching online, you can give through our website, jerseyshorebaptist.com. There's a giving link. There's a phone number that you can text to give, and then there's, you can always mail in your offering. And at this time, we're going to pray for the offering. Father, Lord, we thank you, God, for today, Lord. We thank you, God, for how you provide for us, Lord. And we thank you, God, for your faithfulness, Lord, this entire year, Lord. And we pray, God, that you would just continue to meet the needs of the church, Lord. I pray, God, that you would um, just continue to use our church here in our community, Lord, to bring forth the gospel to those that need it. And Father, Lord, we pray, God, that you would just be with the specials to follow, Lord. We pray, God, that they um, would honor and glorify you and that they would be a blessing to the congregation. And Father, we pray for the message. We pray, God, that you would even now prepare our hearts for the message, Lord. I pray, God, that you would um, just uh, get us ready for it, Lord. I pray, God, that we would be in tune with your Holy Spirit and that you would speak to us. Father, Lord, we love you. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
was awake before the sun with the Bible opened up, seeking truth with every single page he turned. Anyone could see my daddy lived what he believed with a gentle heart, a passion for Jesus' blood. I know we had our times we disagree, but the longer I live, it's clear to me. I want to be that man who loves the Lord with all his heart, just like the word commands, who takes a stand. Family, as he holds the Father's hand, I want to be that man. Society would say there's a new ideal today, not what you give, it's more about what you can give. But I want to live a life that's marked by sacrifice. Like the Savior who died to show us all the way. So I'll take up my cross and trace his steps. Surrendering is how I serve him best. I want to be that man who loves the Lord with all his heart. Just like the word commands. Who takes a stand and leads his family as he holds the Father's hand? I want to be that man. Just like Peter, Paul, and all the saints of days gone by, let me show the kind of faith to those who come behind. Where you going? I'm going home. Good spot. Don't leave yet, Sarah. I mean, my wife came up to the front. She never comes up to the front row because it's Emerson's birthday. And she said, we got to sing happy birthday to Emerson. Is anybody else's birthday today or this week? Becca's birthday. Becca's birthday? Today? Oh, that's right. Uh, uh, Sammy told me it was your birthday today. Oh, happy birthday. Anybody else? Bill, it's your birthday? 19th? All right. And you're 100 and 103. It's awesome. Yeah, Justin's and Weston's were also like just within the last couple of days. What, what did you say? Ah, okay. I see. Anybody else? All right. He's going to shut my mic off. Amen. She'll be coming around collecting dollars from everybody. Amen. Becca's a little bigger. She'll be collecting $20 bills from everybody. All right. Junior Church, you're dismissed. And the rest of us, we will be in 2 John. We're continuing our study here through... Um,
John's epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. We finished a couple weeks ago, 1st John, and we're only going to spend one week uh, here going through 2nd John. It's only 13 verses. matter of fact, 3rd John uh, is 14 verses. They're both very, very short epistles, and really they're kind of addendums, if you will, to the uh, information that was already given in 1st John. And so, um, anyway, but they're great books and great, uh, a lot of great amount of truth in these, in these books, especially the emphasis in 2 John here. And so we're going to be talking about love and truth. And sometimes the two uh, concepts, love and truth, they seem almost to be contrary or opposite one to the other. Uh, some Christians believe that love is all that matters. Remember the Beatles song, all you need is love. And... Uh, Others would claim that truth is supreme, and sometimes churches will emphasize truth over love, and others place a priority on love. And the fact is that love and truth are not mutually exclusive ideas or concepts. Um, In fact, true biblical love needs to be rooted or grounded in the truth. And this little 13-verse letter written by the Apostle John nearly 2,000 years ago Uh, emphasizes the codependence, the mutual inclusiveness of love and truth. And uh, they're codependent upon each other. Biblical love is a love that is rooted or grounded in the truth. And so that's what John is emphasizing. Now, he spent a lot of time talking about love in 1 John. You know, there were several verses, literally a dozen verses that dealt with you know, the fact that we need to love one another. And I think what happened was, is perhaps they took the concept of love and went beyond what God ever intended that concept of love to be. In other words, there's a world's concept of love and what love is, and then there's God's concept of love. And the world would say we're not loving sometimes if we stand for the truth. Yet God insists that our love must be grounded in the truth. And so we want to talk about love that's rooted in the truth. And so uh, we'll be here. We'll also be in Ephesians chapter 4. It's the only other passage of scripture I'll ask you to turn to. But let's pray before we jump into it. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. I pray, God, that you would bless this time. I pray first and foremost for anybody that might be here today that doesn't know Christ as their Savior. I pray, God, that today they would hear the truth regarding their sin and regarding their need for a Savior. And Father, I pray they'd be convicted in their heart and persuaded uh, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. I pray for those of us who are already saved, Lord, and that would be the majority of people, if not all the people in this room, I pray that we would have a, a biblical understanding of both truth and love. Truth is extremely important, and while we definitely want to be loving Christians, we want our love to be grounded and rooted in the truth. And so, Father, I pray you'd help us to understand what all that means, and I pray that I would communicate it clearly. Help me, Father, as I, as I do my best to try to convey this truth, and help me to understand it myself as well. And God, we love you. We pray you bless. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. All right, a little bit of background, both 2 John and 3 John, again, they seem to be almost, I said, I use the word addendums, postscripts um, to 1 John. There's really no new subject that's introduced in 2 or 3 John. Um, This letter, 2 John, is written to somebody called the elect lady and her children. And we really don't know what that is. Uh, Some people believe that the elect lady is an actual person that John knew and it's written to her and her family. Some people believe, and I believe this is the correct interpretation, that this elect lady is actually a local church. Uh, Matter of fact, if you look at verse 13, look what it says there. It says, the children of thy elect sister greet thee. And so John is writing this But he's saying, he's writing it to an elect lady and her children, and he's referring back to this other elect sister and her children. So the members of this other local church seem to be the intention there. And, you know, it's it's happened in other letters. Peter referred, when he was writing, he was actually writing from Rome. He was in Rome when he was put to death, but yet he said that he was writing from Babylon. The church at Babylon salutes thee. So he's using Babylon as almost like a... A, 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 a parable, if you will, an illustration talking about the wickedness and corruptness of the Roman Empire. And so, so we see this in other places. This was at the end of the first century. It was a very, very difficult time. And so he may not have addressed it specifically, uh, though it 
obviously went to the intended audience. And so, um, and again, John doesn't really present any new truth in this second letter, but he does repeat and reemphasize some of the themes that he discussed in the first letter. He strongly admonishes the readers uh, regarding their adherence to the truth and that they would be strongly opposed to false doctrine. And there was a lot of false doctrine, particularly by the end. You know, keep in mind, John is the last apostle alive. All the other apostles are now off the scene. This is probably in the 90s of the first century, very early 90s of the first century. And uh, a lot of false apostles, false prophets had crept into Christendom in general and were creeping into the churches. And John was concerned that his emphasis on love in the first letter extended beyond just brothers and sisters in Christ and went to people who they were almost tolerating uh, in the name of love who were espousing another gospel besides the, the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. In other words, God, he encourages people to be hospitable. We're supposed to be hospitable. We're supposed to entertain people. We're supposed to be in fellowship, in communion with other people. But we're not supposed to be in fellowship and communion with other people at that intimate of a level if they're not believers. In other words, they have to believe what we believe. I'm not saying that, you know, they split hairs on minor issues in the Bible. I mean, they have to believe what we believe. Now, again, we all struggle with this because all of us have loved ones. We have family members that don't believe like we believe. And so I would say there's a level of intimacy and fellowship that we have with family members and even maybe co-workers or friends, but there also is this level of intimacy, this, you know, the Bible says not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, okay? So we're not supposed to marry an unbeliever. We're not supposed to be in partnership in some kind of a business relationship with an unbeliever. And so um, I would say this, there's a level that we're supposed to kind of stay separated from the rest of the world, and we need to be careful who we allow in in our lives at that level of intimacy where they can come in and influence us. And so you have to decide, wherever you are in this, where you would draw the line as far as family members, as far as friends, uh, co-workers, or whatever it might be, or even, you know, the Jehovah Witness that comes and knocks on your door. Because there's a verse in here that clearly indicates that you're not supposed to welcome them into your house, and you're not supposed to wish them well. You're not supposed to say, well, you know, you're a Christian, we're a Christian, you know, we may believe differently, but God bless you anyway. You're not supposed to do that. It's clearly taught in this passage of Scripture. And the way you'll be able to know the difference is to be grounded yourself in the truth. Now, again, let me emphasize this. We're supposed to be kind to everybody. Anybody that needs food, you're to feed them. Anybody, regardless. Jesus said, love your enemies. But you need to be careful who you allow to get really, really close to you, to where they're influencing you or maybe influencing your family or in the case of a church, influencing your church. Um, and so John clearly limits hospitality to those within the household of faith. By the way, Paul also addressed this issue in the book of Titus, chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. I'll just quote it for you. He, he says this, he said, there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers especially they of the circumcision, talking about the nation of Israel. He said, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And so he's talking to this lady, this church, and her house, her children, the members of the church. Here, Paul says, they subvert whole houses. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6, he said, for of this sort are they which creep into houses, and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. And so, again, we want to emphasize love, but we don't want to take love beyond where God ever intended love to go. You follow what I'm saying? And it's kind of tough to convey this, but, but I think you can understand. There's two different extremes, it seems, in churches. Some churches, they emphasize love. We just need to love everybody and love everything. 
and, you know, we tolerate, we don't talk about sin because we don't want to offend people who may be guilty of those sins. And in the name of love, we tolerate, in the name of love, we, we accept everything and everybody and even, you know, would, would go along with what they're doing. Then the other side of the street over here, you have people that are really strong on doctrine, truth, and we're heavy in doctrine. But again, doctrine or truth and love are not mutually exclusive. They're mutually inclusive. They're codependent upon each other. So we stand for truth, but we don't want to go so far in standing for the truth where we're completely unkind and unloving, and we go beyond where God would want us to go in condemning falsehood or standing against some kind of immorality or whatever. We want to, we want to have a biblical position on this. And uh, this point will come home uh, a little bit more even tonight when we talk about the subject of homosexuality. Because at one extreme, you have people that are what I'd call gay bashers and, you know, they're advocating violence to the homosexual community, which is completely crazy and insane, and God would never advocate or promote that. On the other side, you have people that are just like, hey, well, anything goes, and, you know, they just, they don't talk about it. They don't mention homosexuality at all, though the Bible clearly teaches against homosexuality. So, again, we want to be careful that we know what God says, and the only way we can do that is to know the truth. The Bible says you shall know the truth, and the truth will what? make you free. And so we can be free in all of these situations if we know the truth. John said he has no greater joy than to hear his children are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy as a pastor to know that the people that call Jersey Shore Baptist Church their home know the truth. We need to know the truth. I want my children in my family to know the truth and be well grounded in Bible doctrine. And at the same time, I want them to have the right concept of love. And so Look at uh, verses 1 through 6. There's only two points to the message. Uh, the first point, the connection between love and truth. And as we read through these verses, I want you to just pay close attention to how many times in this passage of Scripture the concept of truth, you see the word commandments at one place, how, how it's connected with love. Well, re read it with me. It says, the elder unto the elect lady and her children whom I love, notice, in the truth. And not I only, but also all they that have known the truth, for the truth's sake which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. Notice this, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we received a commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, or beg or implore thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And by the way, again, that was the emphasis of 1 John. Uh, so many different times that phrase, the new commandment, an old commandment. Uh, it, he said it's not a new commandment, it's an old commandment. We had the commandment from the beginning, but Jesus emphasized the commandment that we should love one another. And so he emphasized that heavily in 1 John. But now watch, he clarifies love. And this is love. Watch this, that we walk after his commandments. So he doesn't just say love, love, love. It's just this gushy kind of feeling, you know, uh, popcorn, bubblegum, cotton candy, and Disneyland. It's just all good in the hood. We just tolerate, accept everything. He says that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. And so the connection is made over and over again regarding love and the truth. Um, notice a couple things uh, before we move past this section. In verse 1, John calls himself an elder. Now, that word elder, uh, sometimes you may have been involved in a church at one point in your life that had elders. Uh, typically, independent Baptist churches have pastors and deacons. We don't, we bypass the elder board. Elders would be, you know, the, the, the word elder is kind of used synonymously with bishop, pastor, elder. It's kind of all the same thing. Now, you may have different people, I believe, in a, in a multiplicity of pastors. I'm not one of these guys that say there's only one pastor. I get it. In our independent Baptist circles, there's one pastor. He's the senior pastor of the church. I guess he's the final say or whatever if there's some kind of discrepancy about some ministry thing. But I also believe that there are men uh, equipped within the congregation that serve as elders, pastors, and we have several of those people here. They not only know the Bible, they minister in the Bible, and they serve in a pastoral capacity. We don't necessarily call them pastor. The closest we come is with Justin. He's the youth 
pastor, but there are other men that serve in pastoral functions. The adult Sunday school teachers all serve in pastoral functions as well. So this word elder is the word that John referred to himself as. It's actually the word presbyteros. We get the word Presbyterian from it. And the elders, pastors, teachers were given the responsibility of making sure their people knew the truth. Now, if you turn in your Bible to Ephesians 4, look there real quick. If you have it and you want to, you can. If not, you don't have to. This is America. It's a free country. You can look up at the screens or not. You choose to do what you want to do. We believe in free will around here. And so look what it says there. I want to begin reading in Ephesians 4 verse 11 and just give a little bit of clarity regarding the same concept that John is giving in 2 John. So he says, and he gave some, God gave us some, and here's what he gave us, apostles and some prophets. Now, they're no longer on the scene. Uh, This is the, the guys that were given the divine gifts as far as they could write the scripture. God gave them the truth. They communicated the truth directly. At best today, we have the Bible and we communicate the truth that was already given through the apostles and the prophets. So... But now we have in some evangelists, that's a church planner, missionary, if you will, and some pastors and teachers. So really, there's no punctuation between pastors and teachers, so it's not talking about two separate offices there. The pastors are teachers. And, And again, we have several people that are serving in pastoral and teaching functions within the body of Christ. So pastors and teaching teachers, notice what they were given for. They was given, they were given for the perfecting, of the saints, the maturing, the building up of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, that's building up, strengthening of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, complete or mature, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now notice this, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There are a lot of people out there that can deceive people. That's why we need to be careful about allowing false doctrine to enter into our homes because sometimes people are very easily deceived. That's why the greatest defense is to be grounded very deeply in the truth. And he says, we're not going to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. But notice verse 15, it says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up, mature, be full-grown Christians into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, and this is kind of a a wordy statement here, but basically he's talking about all the different members of the body doing their job, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, every part of the body has a different function, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Well, that's some sentence there. But notice in verse 17, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. So we have to be separated from those philosophies that are contrary to the word of God. And it goes on to talk about these Gentiles who are very vain in their minds and their imaginations, Romans 1 would say. Verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Because of the blindness of their heart. In other words, they're blind. They don't, they don't, the Bible says the God of this world, little G, Satan, hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. They're blinded to the truth. And, um, and so they're blind in their heart. They can't understand spiritual truth. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. And so uh, blindness of their heart. Notice verse 19. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. That's unbridled lust to work all uncleanness with greediness. But notice he said, you, believers, you've not so learned Christ, if so be that you have heard him, and notice this, have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. There are a lot of people who are believers, but they haven't been taught by him. They mean taught sufficiently to be saved, but you haven't been taught, you haven't been grounded in the truth. Um, that you put off, he says, you gotta separate, you gotta stop this, put off concerning the former conversation, that's our lifestyle behavior, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So listen, what God is saying here through the Apostle Paul and the church at Ephesus is that you've been taught, or you should be taught these doctrines, you should be grounded heavily in the truth of the word of God and that will have 
a very big impact in, as to how you love other people. You will be able to love other people more if you're grounded in the truth, but it will be a biblical love, not just a soft, gushy kind of a feeling and be nice to everybody. Now, we ought to be nice to everybody, but you follow what I'm saying. We, don't, we can't tolerate sin. And uh, boy, I've been convicted about this myself. There have been often times I'd hear people make statements that are completely contrary to the word of God, and I don't say anything. I, I think speaking the truth in love would include being lovingly corrective to people who are saying things that are not true regarding God. And uh, well, we're all God's children. Well, no, we're not all God's children. We're all the creation of God, but but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So we're not all the children of God. And people just make statements. And, well, we're under grace. We can do anything. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. And we need, to, we need to stand, but we need to stand in a loving, Christ-like, biblical way. I believe Christ had the ability to teach anybody who had a different opinion. That didn't extend to the Pharisees. They had a different opinion, but they were unteachable, and Christ knew that. Now, we don't know who's teachable, who's not teachable. I know this. If somebody wants to argue with me, I'm not going to argue with them. But if somebody has an open heart and they're asking me sincere questions about what I believe, I'm, I'd be more than willing to give them what the Bible says. Having said that, I'm not real big on trying to argue about homosexuality or anything else with lost people. I believe our job with lost people is to give them the gospel. Lost people don't need to figure out what's wrong with drinking alcohol or all these other different things. Lost people need Christ. That's what they need. And then once they're saved, we can debate about all these other issues and look into the Bible. But they need Christ. They cannot understand the Bible until they're saved. And so that's what our focus ought to be. So anyway, um, notice real quick just a couple other things in this section before we move on. Notice in verse 2, the Bible says there, uh, for the truth's sake which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Notice the truth of God will never go away. Like what Jesus said, he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall never pass away. Peter said this, he said, seeing you have purified your soul and obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. And I read that verse on purpose because it deals with loving one another, but then in verse 23, it connects it with the truth. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You know, the Bible says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. Our world is changing. The world's opinion on all of these different social issues has changed cataclysmically in the past 20, 30, 40, 50 years. But God has never changed on any of these issues. He changeth not. By the way, God has never changed. We're going to see this tonight. Sometimes we get this idea that, well, that's Old Testament. God's opinion about sin in the Old Testament is exactly the same as the opinion on sin in the New Testament. It hasn't changed. Is there grace in the New Testament, forgiveness? Yes, there is. But his opinion, God still hates it. He still hates sin. And he loves people, but he hates the sin. And we ought to have that same position, by the way. Um, notice in verse 3 and 4 what it says there. The Bible says, um, Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Notice he said, I rejoice greatly that I found thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. And I read already, or I quoted in, in 3 John, he said he has no greater joy than to hear that his children are walking in the truth. Matter of fact, the verse before that, verse 3 said, For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in truth. So these people did not just understand truth. They followed it. They walked in it. And, and what we're talking about here, as far as a true Bible believer, is not just somebody that acknowledges something with their head, but that they believe it, and they believe it to the extent that it makes an impact in their lives. And if your Christian experience has an impact the way you live, you may wonder, is it a genuine Christian experience? In other words, what I'm saying, and I get, I'm not trying to get anybody to deny their, or to question their salvation, I'm merely saying, when I got saved, my life changed. Not automatically and not overnight, but there was all of, all of a sudden, there was something going on inside my heart that made me feel bad when I did wrong. Had, gave me a desire for the things of God. 
And sometimes, you know, you see people that claim that they're, that they're saved. Oh, yeah, I got saved. But yet they can walk out of a church service and live exactly like everybody else in the world lives. And again, I'm not trying to put the focus on our, our works because it's not about us. It's about him. All I'm merely trying to say is if he is inside of you, he's going to do a work in you that's going to come out of you eventually. And First John was very, very, uh, talked a lot about that as well. In verse Verses 5 and 6, uh, notice that, we'll read them really quickly. It says, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. I guess we had that emphasized in the first, uh, first John, the first letter. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. Um, this is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. And so we see again this clarification, if you will, this re-emphasis on love, but through the lens of truth. And, um, you know, again, we should love everybody in a general way, even our enemies, but there should be a special connection, a special intimacy, if you will, between those that belong to Christ, to Jesus. And um, this is especially true, by the way, when believers are going through a rough time. And uh, we're going to start seeing a little bit more of a rough time in America, in our, in our even Western culture, we've been immune from this for quite a while, but it's, it's coming soon. Um, Paul Chapel just sent out an a, uh, article about a, a third pastor in Canada that's in jail. And uh, the rules in Canada are I mean, just insane. I mean, we thought we had it bad here in America. But it, the rule in Canada is you can have 15% of your congregation. Now, keep in mind, Canada has less cases than we do. Less percentage-wise, I know the population's less, less percentage-wise cases than we do. It's far less than where we are today. But churches, they're real strict about it. And, and here's what happened to this particular pastor. They threatened him. They said, if you, if you open up, we're going we're gonna to arrest you. So he, you can read the article if you want it. I'll send it to you. I sent it out on the prayer group yesterday. But uh, and I'm, I'm, I might be butchering the article. You can read it for yourself. But basically what happened was is they decided, they announced to their church we're going to be meeting at an undisclosed location. I think they were meeting outside somewhere, like either in a park or in the woods or something like that. So the congregation gathered together outside, and the police sent a helicopter in, a helicopter, and found them meeting together. And they, they, they came to the pastor's house the next morning, with, and I'm not blaming the police, they're under orders from the government. Um, they arrested him, and he's in jail, and they were going to let him go, but, but uh, he had to promise that he wouldn't meet again with his church, and he refused. He said, I can't obey God's commandment to gather together, and still, you know, the, the 15% was just way, way unreasonable. And so, you know, we're going through tough times. You know, this COVID thing was a tough time. And there was opinions all over the place. Should we open? Should we not open? I, I get all that. Should we wear a mask, not wear a mask? I mean, there were churches literally split down the middle over this. We, we praise the Lord, managed to escape a lot of the problems that some of the other churches had gone through. I'm merely trying to say this, though. When churches are going through difficult times, you need brothers and sisters in Christ that are for you, that are going to love you, that are going to care for you, and that you're going to care for them and love them. The example uh, I gave in the earlier service from Acts chapter 2, we won't go to the passage of Scripture, but if you look at Acts chapter 2, you have the early church, and these were persecuted people. They were mostly Jewish believers in the early days, right after Pentecost, so you get Jewish believers, and when a Jewish believer gets saved, they have a funeral for them. The family members won't talk to them anymore. They, uh, they just won't. I mean, they, they, they're, you're not part of our family anymore. And so they, uh, they kind of gathered together and they supported each other. And, you know, if, if somebody had extra stuff, they sold it so they could support the people that didn't have stuff. But they were there for each other. They prayed with each other. They, were, they loved each other. And that's this biblical concept of love. And so it's especially true during the difficult times. All right, I've got to hurry. Look at the, the second point here. Uh, John was concerned that the concept of love would overshadow truth, that love would somehow be disconnected from the truth, that they would have a non-biblical concept of love. Let's read verses 7 down through verse 13. Uh, it says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. 
this is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourself that we, notice this, lose not the things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Let me just mention something about that real quick. The Bible talks about rewards, and I don't have time to go through it all. By the way, it's on the notes. If you want to get the full message, there's always a whole lot more on the notes. If you go to the front page of the website, right underneath the live feed, click on the button that says notes for Sunday morning, you can get all the notes. But there are five different rewards or crowns the Bible talks about. There's the uh, incorruptible crown, or I call the striver's crown. There's the crown of rejoicing, or the soul winner's crown. There's the crown of righteousness, or the soldier's crown. And by the way, on the notes, I have all the verses that go along with these. The crown of life, or the sufferer's crown. And that's a martyr's crown, those that die for their faith. And then there's the crown of glory, the shepherd's crown. And uh, crowns, they were, you know, in, in, if you were a runner in the Olympics, they gave you an award, a crown. And, uh, but these were crowns for living for the Lord and that will be given someday. Now, as a believer, you cannot lose your salvation. If you're saved, you're saved forever. You're God's child. It's a permanent thing that cannot be undone. But you can lose your rewards. And I don't necessarily believe some, some uh, preachers I've heard said that, you know, you accumulated this whole life full of rewards. You live for the Lord. You did a bunch of things. And you got a lot of rewards coming. And 15 minutes before you died, you did something stupid and you lose all your reward. I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think God will be very just and fair. And let's face it, none of us deserve anything. So whatever we get is awesome. And just going to heaven is awesome enough. But we don't want to lose our rewards. Forgetting about the reward itself, we don't want to do something that's worthy of uh, of losing a reward in that we're not glorifying God or we're somehow working against the cause of Christ. And, uh, you know, uh, John said, receive a full reward. Jesus said in the book of Revelation, he said, let no man take your crown. Well, let nobody take it away from you. Um, receive a full reward. Let's not, let's not lose the things that we've worked for. And so I think sometimes if we, if we get an unbiblical view of love, where we take it beyond truth, we'll tolerate some things and accept some things that are working against Christ and what he's trying to do. And I believe, listen, we need to be sticklers regarding the truth, but we need to do it in love. Speak the truth, the Bible says, in love. Um, so uh, anyway, and, and I'm, I want to look at this passage of Scripture, and I'll read it to you real quick. I know we're running out of time, but I'm almost done, and I'm not lying when I say that now. I know most of the time I lie when I say that, but 1 Corinthians chapter 3, talking about rewards. And just so you understand this whole concept of rewards. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11, the Bible says this, But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, now the foundation is Christ, that's salvation. He said, if any man build upon this foundation, so above the foundation of Christ, we have gold, silver, precious stones. Notice those three are very valuable. Then he says, wood, hay, and stubble. Wood, hay, and stubble are not valuable. They're, they're worthless. So we can build upon the foundation of salvation valuable things, things that are valuable to the cause of Christ or things that are worthless to the cause of Christ. Some of the things we do are valuable to Christ. Some of the things that we do are not valuable. They're worthless. Notice how they're going to be tried. Every man's work shall be made manifest, so they'll be seen or revealed. Now, by the way, this is not a judgment for sin. Your sin was judged if you're saved. It was judged on Calvary. Christ paid for your sin. This is a judgment for, to determine rewards. Every man's work um, shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire will try every man's work of what sort it is. So our works will spiritually, symbolically go through a fire. And if they survive, wood, hay, and stubble don't survive fire. They get burnt up. But gold, silver, and precious stone are actually purified and made better through a fire. You heard about gold. They put gold in the fire and it melts down and then they, they scrape the chaff off at the top. It becomes more pure gold. So uh, if any man's work abide which he hath built there, thereupon, he shall receive a reward if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Bottom line is, let's not lose our reward by having a non-biblical approach to this matter of love. In uh, verses 9 through 11, by the way, we won't read them again, but John makes it very clear that we as a church, and by the way, as individual believers also, we're supposed to be close and support people who believe and promote the fundamental doctrines of Christianity, and we're supposed to separate ourselves from people who don't as much as you can. 
You know, the Bible says as much as life in you in, as much as life in you is, try to live peaceably with all men. So we need to live peaceably at some level. We need to love everybody. People who are hungry need food. People who have, need clothing. People who need the gospel need the gospel. We give them the gospel. But there's a level of fellowship or intimacy that, that we need to be very, very careful about crossing the line with people who hold a different doctrine, especially people that are promoting a different doctrine or maybe a different lifestyle, whatever, than God would say is acceptable or God would say is right. Now, let me say this. I didn't mention this in the earlier service. Maybe I should have. If you're already married to somebody who's an unbeliever, God does not want you to get divorced. So, you know, every time I, I talk about being unequally yoked, people say, uh, I, I, the pastor said I need to leave my husband or leave my wife. No, I'm not saying that at all. The Bible's very clear. If he be pleased or she be pleased to stay with you, you stay with him. You may be able to win him over. That's, it's done. It's over with. You're married. You're already yoked up together. But if you're contemplating entering into any kind of relationship, whether it be a husband and wife relationship or whether it be a business relationship or any kind of relationship with other people, if it's a pretty deep relationship, you, may, you need to make sure you're on the same page spiritually. And so, all right, let me just give you a couple of practical thoughts and, and then we're done. Um, first of all, if, if you are to have this level of knowledge of truth so that you can um, differentiate and know what love means, you're going to have to immerse yourself in the truth and you're going to have to separate from falsehood. Psalm 1 says, blessed is the man that walketh what? Not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. That says it all, really. It goes on to say, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And so God wants us to prosper. He wants us to be successful, but we're going to have to be, we're going to have to walk away or stay away from the counsel of the ungodly, the way of sinners, and the seed of the scornful. And we're going to have to delight in the law of the Lord. So we immerse ourselves in the truth. How do you do that? Well, you read your Bible. Do you read your Bible? I hope you read your Bible. And, and I know we all say, yeah, we read our Bible. But really, I mean, is reading the Bible like a chore to you? Every morning do you get up excited about, hey, let me start the day off. I'm going to read the scriptures. We need to study the Bible. Uh, you know, we're starting this Faith Bible Institute. That's a great tool for studying the Word of God. We need to memorize the Bible. We need to come hear the Bible preached and, and taught. I always, uh, I always want to say preached and, and teached, but it's uh, taught and preached. And we need to avoid and stay away as much as possible from the philosophies of the world. The world is bombarding us. I mean, every commercial out there is just bombarding us with an ungodly philosophy. We need to be very, very careful that we're not allowing these philosophies, not just, I mean, I think we're grounded enough to know, okay, what they're saying is wrong, but we get to the place where it doesn't bother us as much as it used to, and we kind of become tolerant and acceptable of it accepting of it. We need to be very, very careful about it. I'm not saying we're not accepting of people. I'm just saying we can never be accepting of any activity, lifestyle, behavior, sin that God says is wrong or any doctrine that God says is wrong. We, we have to stand for the truth. And so immerse yourself in the truth, separate from falsehood. Secondly, keep truth as the center of your home and family. Make sure your children, you know, it's Father's Day. Dad, challenge yourself. Make sure your children are learning the Word of God. If you're a single mom, you're, you're serving as the dad in the family. Or maybe if you're, uh, you know, you're, the, uh, you're the mom and you're the only believer, if you're the dad and the only believer. Boy, you, to, you got extra duty in making sure your children, grandchildren, are grounded in the truth. And by the way, if you're a grandfather and your kids are raised, if you've got grandkids, boy, use every ounce of influence you have in their lives to try to influence them uh, for the word of God. And dads need to take the lead in the area of teaching truth. And I've never been good at it. I failed miserably at this in my life. Family devotions is a great tool. If you could ever be like that Ozzie and Harriet family where you're all at the breakfast table at the same time together, we've never been able to do that. We've always been on different schedules. But man, family devotions are a great, great tool. Carve some time out, maybe once a week even, where you're spending time together as a family in the word of God. 
Guard your home against any kind of doctrinal heresy or worldly philosophy that goes against the truth. Listen, if the sitcom you're watching is promoting all kinds of stuff that's ungodly, don't watch it. It's just that simple. Think about it. You, you spend five minutes a day reading the Word. If you follow our blog schedule, PastorErickson.com, and you read through all the second miler and everything else, you spend 30 minutes in the Word of God each day. And you'll spend, I'll spend, you know, two hours, three hours, four hours watching sitcoms or television. And again, I'm not saying it's all bad, and I'm not saying you shouldn't watch television ever. I'm just saying a lot of those philosophies are just pouncing on you. They're just, you're getting flooded with it. And you, you, it, you can't help but have them influence you. And so you need to be careful about it. Um, much of what we're entertained with on television, social media, and all these other things, they espouse a philosophy that's contrary to the truth. And you need to live the truth in front of your family. Be the right example. Be real. Um, you know, just be a real Christian. You know, be what God wants you to be. Uh, make church, by the way, a priority. Uh, there should not and there doesn't need to be a great goal fixed between love and the truth. Truth and love need to be merged together. If your children are going to survive, if your home is going to survive in these very dark last days that we're living in. Now, I'm telling you, we're going to be put in a position where we're, we're going to need to fight. And we're going to need to stand. And uh, without the truth, you're not going to make it. You need the truth. The truth coupled with love. But it's not this gushy kind of love. Well, God says we're supposed to love everybody, so I know everybody's doing wrong, but I'm just going to let it go. No, you have to stand, for, but you've got to do it in a Christ-like and biblical way, speaking the truth in love. All right, let's pray. Father... Thank you, God. I pray that you would help us. I pray especially for the dads that are here today, though this wasn't really a Father's Day message. God, help us to be the pillars in our home. I know the church is the pillar and ground of the truth, but help the fathers, the grandfathers that are here to be strong in the truth. Help us, dear God, to stand boldly for what's right, not in an arrogant or an obnoxious way, but in a Christ-like and loving way. But help us, dear God, not to take our love beyond the truth. Help us not to accept or condone or tolerate or put up with things that are contrary to the cause of Christ, contrary to sound doctrine, contrary to the moral principles found throughout the Bible. Help us, dear Lord, to stand as we ought to stand. And God, I pray that you would just convict us about that. We've put up with too much. We've tolerated too much. We've entertained people and things in our homes that ought have been, you know, shut out at the door. And God, I pray that you'd help us with that. God, I pray for the one that may be here today that doesn't know Christ as their Savior. I pray, God, that they would see Christ bleeding and dying on the cross for them. I pray that they would realize that they're sinners, that they're sinners in need of a Savior. I'm a sinner, but I got saved. And you're willing to save anybody that comes to you. And uh, even all these sins that we talked about, you'll save any of that. You'll save any of them that are guilty of those things, even Christians that are guilty of these things. God, convict us of us and help us to humbly turn to you. God, I pray you'd bless. Bless during the invitation, God, for it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Just for a moment, I know it's a little bit late. But if God spoke to your heart and you want to come and pray at the altar, the altar is open. Um, Maybe you've been getting a little lax in your home regarding the truth. Or maybe you have a problem on the other side of that uh, spectrum. You have a problem with love. Uh, you, you're not willing to love people that in a certain way, at a, even at a, a bare minimum level, that don't espouse the same truth that you, you do. And we need to love those people enough to give them the gospel and to care about them. But we need not to love them so much where we're, we're intimate with them in fellowship. It's tough to draw the line. We have to figure out and pray about where God wants us to do that. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, well, I'd love to be able to talk to you after the service. I'll be standing over there by the, by the baptistry, guarding the coke. And uh, no, but uh, if you need, you need any information, any questions about the Word of God or about salvation, I'd love to be able to answer your questions and help you out any way I can. I don't know all the answers, but I know some, and I'll help you out any way I can. Mics were mixed up. I couldn't figure out which one I needed to grab. Just wanted to remind before we close out with our chorus.
Uh, if you are a father, just remember we have gifts for you on that baptistry. Make sure you swing by and just grab one or two. Um, we don't want the kids to have them, as Pastor was saying. So two, three, maybe. So uh, at this time, let's close out our service with our chorus. We'll run the race. We'll run the race. We will press on. Keep up the pace. Don't quit today. Encourage those along the way. Continue on in Jesus' name. Our strength to run is in Christ alone. We'll fix our eyes on Jesus' face. The one who saved us by his grace. Amen. And you are dismissed.